The reason many deny the existence of free will is because they believe there is no room for free will in a purely deterministic universe. This particular argument against free will can be traced back to a thought experiment done by Pierre Simon Laplace in 1814. Laplace speculated if some omniscient being, what he refers to as a demon, knew the precise location and momentum of every atom in the universe, it would also perfectly know both the past, present, and future by following the chain of causation, either backward or forward. This would make its perspective infinite since it knows everything in contrast to our own finite perspectives. Now, there are a number of objections we can make against the conclusions Laplace comes to in his thought experiment, but for the purposes of this video, let us just assume he is correct. Namely, from an all-knowing, infinite perspective, the universe is fully deterministic, with every event, every choice determined by antecedent causes. The argument I'm going to make in this video is even assuming a fully determined past, present, and future, free will still can and does exist, but it is not what you think it is. To claim free will and strict determinism are not consistent is to assume free will and indeterminism are consistent with each other. But just think of doing something for no reason at all. What if a man jumped out of a 12-story window? For no reason whatsoever. Was he exercising his free will? No, I don't think so. Instead, it seems more like an act of insanity, although even insanity has reasons or causes behind it. No, free will is not the lack of reasons or causes. Instead, to have free will means someone consciously chose to do, do something or say something, but they did it for a reason, not no reason. Free will is not therefore to be undetermined, but to be self-determined. Being self-determined is not the only prerequisite for the existence of free will. Free will also presupposes some degree of ignorance regarding the future choices someone is going to make. If we already know the choices we are going to make in the, in the future, they have, in a sense, already happened. Like our past choices, they have already been predetermined. Of course, no sane person claims perfect knowledge of the future. However, it is possible to assume such an infinite perspective upon the universe, uh, but only do it on a hypothetical as-if basis. Like Laplace, we can imagine ourselves uh, to being all-knowing and then ask ourselves what implications this would have. One of these implications is we would not possess free will since, as already explained, all our choices, past and present, and future have already been predetermined. But why would anyone want to invest final authority in determining what is real or not in such an imaginary perspective? And after all, it is just imaginary. It's just hypothetical, not actual. The answer can be summed up in two words, objective reality. Objective reality is what is assumed to exist independent of any and all finite and therefore subjective perspectives. In other words, for something to be objective, it must at least in theory exist not from a finite, but from an infinite perspective. In philosophical terms, the concept of objective reality is essentialist in its understanding of what is real or not real. Essentialism can be traced back to Plato himself. Plato claimed our essentiary experiences were mere shadows of the perfect and eternal realm of our forms or essences. And it is from the word essence the term essentialism is derived. For example, according to Plato, a mother is only an imperfect manifestation or shadow of the perfect essence of motherhood. But what does any of this have to do with objective reality? The concept of objective reality serves the same function and purpose as Plato's realm of forms in determining what is real or not real. But did not Plato regard his realm of forms as even more real than our actual experience of reality? While the infinite perspective behind objective reality is only hypothetical, it's as if. But those who assume the existence of objective reality hardly ever regard it as only imaginary and hypothetical. Quite the contrary. They regard it in the same way as Plato regarded his realm of forms that is, more real than our actual experiences as acquired through finite subjective perspectives. 
We could even describe objective reality as hyper-real from this essentialist point of view compared to our actual experiences of the universe. Thus, both Plato's realm of forms and the concept of objective reality are non-empirical insofar as they rely on something other than our actual experiences as derived from our actual finite perspectives in determining what is real or not. And this is what lies at the crux of essentialism, either in its ancient or modern form, namely a non-empirical way of determining what is real or not real. While Plato was the first to clearly articulate the essentialist theory of what it means to exist, Gautama Siddhartha, better known as the Buddha, was the first to articulate the most credible alternative to essentialism. This alternative theory regarding what it means to exist came as a central insight the Buddha had while sitting under the Bodhi tree seeking enlightenment. In Sanskrit, this insight is known as Patritya Samupada, and in English has been translated as dependent co-arising or interdependent arising. But in this video, I will refer to it as relationalism. It is through its relationships rather than its essence, a particular thing derives its characteristics and very existence. Uh, for example, a stone weighs what it does because of its relationship to the earth, not by partaking of some essence of stoneness or by corresponding to some objective stone as viewed from an infinite perspective. One important difference between essentialism and relationalism has to do with perspective. For essentialism, there is only one perspective that ultimately counts in determining the existence and nature of something. It is the infinite perspective behind Plato's realm of forms and implied by the concept of objective reality. Or to put it differently, a thing like free will is what it is, regardless and independent of any finite perspective upon it. In contrast, relationalism determines the existence and nature of a thing like free will through one or more finite perspectives. This makes ascertaining what is real much more tricky since what exists from one perspective might not exist from another. Conceive of this in terms of how different perspectives involve different relationships. For example, a particular odor exists because of the relationship between a subtle perfume and the olfactory senses for one person, but not exists from the slightly less sensitive olfactory senses of another person. When it comes to the existence or non-existence of something like free will, however, the perspectives involved and their corresponding relationships become much more complicated. But in order to keep things as simple as possible, let us limit ourselves to just two perspectives, that of the woman of a woman and her therapist in this example. A woman informs her therapist she has decided to break off her engagement with her, her fiancé. Her therapist is not surprised since he knew she was going to do so months before because of some buried trauma. From her perspective, however, she was ex exercising her free will in breaking off her engagement. But from the perspective of her therapist, her decision to do so was already be predetermined by the trauma she had experienced years before. So which one is right? The very question of who is right presupposes some infinite true for everyone point of view in which either she has free will or does not have it. In other words, it presupposes the existence of objective reality. But instead of depending upon some hypothetical infinite perspective in determining what is real or not, let us take the relationless point of view and confine ourselves to the perspectives of the woman and her therapist in determining wh whether she was exercising her free will or not in breaking off her engagement. The way to go about doing this is to examine each perspective to see if the two criteria necessary for free will are satisfied or not. The first criterion was it had to be her who made the conscious choice to break off the engagement, making it self-determined. This criterion is met from both perspectives since they both would agree she consciously made the decision to break off her engagement. 
The second criterion for the existence of free will is ignorance regarding what choices one will make in the future. And this is where the two perspectives differ. Because her therapist knew she was going to break it off um, months before, from his perspective, she was not exercising her free will in doing so. Instead, her choice to break off her engagement was predetermined by her trauma she had experienced years before. From the woman's perspective, the second criterion necessary for the existence of free will was met. Since she had no idea she was going to break off her engagement until shortly before she did break it off. That both perspectives could be correct at the same time seems impossible only because of the assumption there exists an infinite all-knowing perspective in which either she has free will or does not. But because we have confined ourselves to just those two finite perspectives, then that's all we have to go on. Whether someone has free will or not depends upon the finite perspectives from which is perceived. So to summarize, disbelief in the existence of free will is a consequence of, the, of investing more authority in an imaginary infinite perspective than in our own finite perspectives. Once we switch exclusively to finite perspectives in determining what is real or not, free will can and does exist from those perspectives meeting the necessary two criteria. From other perspectives on those same choices, however, free will may not exist since they do not meet one or more of the two criteria. And just as a reminder, those two criteria are first, being a willful conscious choice, and second, prior ignorance regarding what the choice will be. This relativity regarding the existence of things applies, of course, not only to free will, but to any and all things. And this relativistic way of understanding the nature of existence has enormous implications in how we conceive of reality. It melts away the is what it is facticity of the essentialist conception of reality and turns it into a fluidic, multidimensional wonderland where something can be real from one perspective, but not real from another. In this video, however, our focus is not upon the nature of reality as such, but only upon free will and whether it exists or not. The answer is it does exist, but it is not what you think it is. It is not some shiny object we either possess or do not possess. Instead, free will arises from a particular set of relationships, especially those having to do with the conscious self and an unknown future.